Welcome back to another video here on the channel. In this one I want to shine some light on the process of how a suggested feature gets implemented into Bitcoin, the Bitcoin improvement proposals. We also take a look at some of the more popular BIPs to understand where Bitcoin is heading or what Bitcoin's future looks like now that Taproot is already activated. First of all, everyone can submit a BIP, a Bitcoin improvement proposal, by first addressing the Bitcoin development mailing list. The developers don't decide which BIPs will be listed, but check the formal requirements of the proposal. We are fairly liberal with approving BIPs and try not to be too involved in decision making on behalf of the community. However, it is still a good idea to publicly discuss an idea and receiving some feedback of the community before writing a BIP to prevent wasting your time. Another important point is that it is highly recommended that a single BIP contains a single key proposal or new idea. The more focused the BIP, the more successful it tends to be. If in doubt, split your BIP into several well-focused ones. Then at that point, you will be assigned a BIP number. So for example, I did BIP 176, which is, you know, utilizing the BITS nomenclature. And that's, uh, that, that's something that Luke, uh, you know, assigned me the number 176 after I had uh, cleaned it up and then, uh, you know, put in a pull request into the BIPS repository and then you're assigned a number. But that's not, that's not the end of it. Once you're assigned a number, it doesn't mean that it's going to get in by, uh, not by any long shot. A BIP first has a draft specification from where it can be deferred, withdrawn, rejected or proposed. During the draft stage, the content can be changed and improved by the authors based on the community feedback. At that point, you go and implement it. Uh, it might be actual code. Um, it, it might, if it's informational, then it, it, it's just sort of ended there. But if it's on the consensus track, well, then you need consensus in order to get it in. Um, and that means writing your code and putting it up for review. And that means that, uh, you know, a lot of different coders have to actually go and review it. Um, and you can't just like sort of object just because it's consensus doesn't mean that, oh, I object, therefore it's not going to get in and you can be Joe Schmo or whatever. No, you have to actually have a good technical reason for why, why you're objecting. And, uh, and the community can judge, okay, that's a legitimate technical reason or that is complete nonsense. A BIP may only change status from draft or rejected to proposed when the author deems it is complete, has a working implementation where applicable and has community plans to progress it to the final status. And after the BIP is proposed, it can become active or final. A proposed BIP may progress to final only when specific criteria reflecting real-world adoption has occurred. In case you want to learn more about the approval process and structure of a proposal, you can check BIP2 which tells you the whole process. Now before we cover some of the current drafts, I quickly want to talk about the activation of a BIP or the progression how it reaches the final status. A crucial differentiation are soft forks and hard forks. Both are updates to the network, but they are very different from one another. The easiest way to understand the two is that a soft fork tightens the rules of the network, while a hard fork expands the rules of the network. Some cryptos like Ethereum change on a hard fork basis. Bitcoin changes through soft forks. The recent Taproot update was a soft fork and Bitcoin's biggest update since SegWit in 2017. To activate a soft fork on the network, you don't just need a majority of miners voting for you, you usually need a supermajority of 95%. This makes sure that Bitcoin is hard to change. Some see it as a weakness, but Bitcoin's immutability naturally leads to its robustness. The rules only change if pretty much everyone wants them to change. Now let's get into some of the exciting potential upgrades to Bitcoin, starting with BIP300, also known as drive chains. These could bring the end to all altcoins. The whole idea of drive chains is porting other projects as Bitcoin sidechains. So if someone asks can Bitcoin do X or Y, referring to features of other coins like ZK Snarks from Zcash or larger blocks and shorter block clearance or whatever, the answer becomes yes, see BIP300. For people who come in and want to quote unquote fix Bitcoin, they can now do that, without any permission on a BIP300 sidechain and more importantly, without compromising the base layer in any way while respecting the 21 million coin limit. The drive chain code is open source and working in a prototype way. It's not vaporware. In fact, the creator of BIP300, Paul Stork, did a YouTube video in which he replicated Zcash on a sidechain. Major benefits of this are that altcoins and tokens in general become less relevant and hard fork campaigns should mostly fade. If you're into NFTs, these can easily be made possible with drive chains as well. They also make the idea of layered money possible, a book in which Nick Batia described the relationship between different digital assets and stated that altcoins are part of the layered money hierarchy. 
If you want to learn more, you can check out the DriveChain presentation from the Bitcoin 2021 conference or check bip300.info for a list of resources. Now let's continue with bip301, so the next one. It's about blind merged mining. What is that? Blind merged mining allows miners to mine a sidechain or altcoin without running its node software. Instead, a separate sidechain user runs their node and constructs the block, paying himself the transaction fees. He then uses an equivalent amount of money to quote-unquote buy the right to find this block from the conventional layer 1 SHA-256 miners. And this sounds somewhat confusing, so I'll just tell you what regular merged mining looks like without the blind part. First, miners must run a full node of the other chains. Thus, they must run non-Bitcoin software, which may be buggy. And second, miners are paid on the other chain, in alt currencies. With blind merged mining, a miner can collect fees on all the other chains without any additional software. Combine this with drive chains bringing all coins on top of Bitcoin and this increased miner incentive could potentially maintain the hash rate security of the network in the long run, which is frankly a big deal. Another proposed feature are covenants, part of BIP119 and others. Covenants would enable whitelisting of addresses, so a user could restrict where his Bitcoin can be sent to, which can make a whole lot of sense from a security perspective. And last but not least, we have cross-input signature aggregation, which is likely the next step now the taproot is activated. This feature, which is also known as CESA, is great for privacy reason because it enables cheaper coin joints. If you want to learn more about coin joints and Bitcoin privacy in general, check out my Bitcoin privacy guide. So what does CESA enable? Instead of paying for the privilege of better privacy, you would be saving money to get better privacy. This will be particularly true of exchanges where a lot of these transactions take place. They will want to coin join existing customer transactions with lots of other transactions to save money, and the side effect will be more privacy for the rest of that transaction. That's it from this video. Feel free to check out some of the bips, all the resources are found in the video description. And if you enjoyed the video, I would appreciate it if you leave a like and subscribe to the channel for further content. And then I see you next time.